When did you start making money on YouTube? So in year one, I made no money. In year two, I made like, I was making like 2K, 3K a month. And then year three was when it just started to grow. I think we're on track to do 4.5 million pounds-ish in revenue by the end of the year. We spend about a million a year on team salaries. And <laughs> That's so a lot of pressure. <laughs> How much do you think you, you spend on equipment? Probably like 50K a year. So can you break down like your revenue? So this year we'll probably do... So can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? So hey yeah. everyone, my name is Ali and I used to be a doctor, but then I quit to be a YouTuber. Hmm. And now I make YouTube videos and write books and I'm an entrepreneur. I've got a team of 14 people and yeah, I've been making YouTube videos for the last six years and being a YouTuber has completely changed my life. I started off videos in medical school and then I continued making videos while I was working as a doctor. And then three years later, I was making more money on YouTube than I would have ever made as a doctor. And so I quit medicine to go full time on this internet entrepreneur, creator, writer type career. And here we are. So what has that journey been like for you, like from being a doctor and transitioning to a creator? Yeah, so in the early days, the biggest challenge was time because mm. I, I was working full time. I'd wake up at like 6.30, drive to work. It would take an hour to get to work. Mm. And then I'd be at work from like eight in the morning till like six in the, in the evening. And then I would drive an hour home from work. So I'd get home by like 7, 7.30. And so between 7.30 and like 10 p.m., mm. that was my window where I could do YouTube stuff. Mm. Alongside like spending time with like my friends and going to the gym and stuff. Mm. And so I had to try and find the most productive ways to spend my time. That's where I got interested in productivity, actually. I just became obsessed with productivity because yeah. I needed to make videos and grow my business while yeah. I was working full time. So guys, we're currently at Ali Abdal's apartment. So let's go in. Oh, hey guys. Hi, how's how it going? Are you? Come on in, how nice are we doing? Nice to meet you. <laughs> welcome, welcome home. So this is the kitchen. It's a oh, bit of a okay. mess right now, but stuff happening in the kitchen. Um, would you like some chocolate? Yeah. You're gonna have you. some dark, dark chocolate over there. <laughs> when did you start making money on YouTube? So in year one, I made no money. In year two, I made like, I was making like 2K, 3K a month, mm. which is pretty good, like 30K at the end of the year. And then year three was when it just started to started to grow. What would you say led to that growth in the third year? Was it consistency or in what the, was it? In the third year, I think a big part was that I outsourced my video editing, which meant I freed up my own time to make more videos. Mm. And B, that was when we started making online courses. Mm. At the time, it was on a platform called Skillshare that you might be familiar with. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so Skillshare revenue started really bumping us up. Mm. And then in year four, we launched our course, Part-Time YouTuber Academy in mm. 2020. And that made like 400K within like two weeks. 400K in two weeks. Yeah. How much did you make like last year from YouTube? Last year, 4.6 million pounds revenue, hmm. 2.5 million pounds expenses, 1.7 million profit or something like that, 1.8 million profit. Wow. On videos? Well, I mean, there's other stuff in the business. Yeah. So like we've got YouTube, podcasts, we've got like the website, we're on all the social media platforms, yeah. except Snapchat. We've got our courses and I've been writing the book for the last three years. So there's like other stuff going on other than YouTube, but YouTube is the main thing. Did you ever imagine that you would be making something like, like this? No, kind hell of no. Amount? Like I still remember <laughs> back when, you know, I got my first sponsorship deal and my first deal was with Rosetta Stone. Oh, really? And they paid me $500. And I was like, whoa, they're paying me $500 for a 60 second integration? Oh my God, wow. Cause that's like two weeks. No, that's like one week salary as a doctor. Oh wow. Like I'm getting it for 60 seconds. It's like one week versus 60 seconds. It's like, my blood. Wait, how much were you making being a doctor? Being a doctor, like 3K a month. So can you break down like your revenue? So this year we'll probably do about 600K in AdSense. Sponsors will be about a million. Our course will probably Probably do 2.5 million. So now we're up to like 4 million ish. Then Skillshare will do like 300K. Affiliate marketing will do like 250. That's like 4.5. And then we have like a few, a few random bits here and there. I think we're on track to do 4.5 million pounds ish in revenue by the end of the year. You know, I know people who are doing even more money than that. I know someone who does 30 million a year from selling courses. Wow. I know someone who does 7 million a year from just AdSense and brand deals. What would you say has been the most important thing that led to this? A lot of luck. <laughs> hmm. um, consistency. Like I've been making videos on YouTube since 2017 now, so six years and pretty much one, two or three videos every week for six years. Last month, we actually took a break for one month. Like that was the longest break we've ever taken on the channel because I was finishing up my book and I was like, okay, I just need to finish the book. I think if you do something over a very long period of time and I got very lucky and also I've always treated it like a business. For me, YouTube was never an artistic expression. Hmm. I don't think of myself as a creative. I think of myself as like a teacher who happens to have a business. If you think of it purely as a business, then you start making decisions that help optimize for that. Plus the fact that I just love it. Like, even if I won the lottery, if you gave me all the money in the world, I would still make YouTube videos hmm. and I would still make videos about the same stuff. Oh, so wow. I somehow found that.
that thing, that infinite game, where I'm playing the game for the sake of playing the game, not playing the game for the sake of some kind of outcome. So I think if you can tap into that sort of passion and that sort of consistency, it then becomes a lot easier. So were you always entrepreneurial or where did like all these entrepreneurship spirits come from? Like when you were young, were you always like into anything that has to do with like entrepreneurship? Yeah, I was obsessed with trying to make money online when I was 11, 12. I learned how to code. So I became a freelance web designer, freelance graphic designer. I tried making my own online game. I tried doing affiliate marketing. I tried doing a pyramid scheme. I tried <laughs> making my own affiliate marketing pyramid scheme website. And then over the next few years, every year I tried to make a new money making scheme. Hmm. But it was only when I got to university that I built a business that helped people get into medical school. Hmm. So I was teaching courses in real life and going to classrooms and booking rooms and printing booklets and teaching people how to get into medical school. That was the first business that I had that actually made any interesting money. Hmm. So teaching has always been part of you like right from time. Yeah, like I've been teaching, I've been helping people with their maths homework since I was like 12. I was working at a place called Kumon, which is like this maths and English study center when I was 13. So I was always teaching. And that was the thing that really brought me fulfillment and meaning and joy. Awesome. So where, where are you from, by the way? Oh, I was born in Pakistan. And then okay. I lived in Lesotho in Africa for five yeah. years. And then I moved to the UK when I was eight. You ride a bicycle? Uh, that's my brother's bike. Oh, okay. I live with my brother and his wife, so mm. it's, it's a good vibe. And this is our living room. Oh, wow. And dining room. Mm. And we've got the piano over there. And then this becomes like a co-working space when our teams are around. So we have some of these like office chairs here. Oh, so you can just, office like, chairs. How office. many people do you have on your team? And, and we've, got, we've got 14 people in the team. Mm. And so um, 14 people, 11 wow. are based in London. And so they come over here to work some of the time. And it's good fun. How was that process of moving, like coming from Africa and deciding to move down to the UK? It felt very normal. Like mm. the, the weirdest thing about it was when I was in Africa, I was the whitest person in the class because everyone was black. Oh wow. And then I come to the UK and I'm the blackest person in the class because everyone's white. white. Like, <laughs> completely like mind-blowing experience. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, no, like I guess when you're young, it's just your new normal, right? It doesn't mm. feel weird because it's your life. So building your business in London, in the UK, how has it been for you? It's been super fun. Like the, the main benefit is that I get to work with people in person. So of our team of 14, 11 are based around London. And so usually we always have three or four people in the office, which is super mm. nice. One of the problems a lot of creators have is managing a team because we never taught that. We didn't learn that from anywhere. Even this YouTube thing, we just kind of like fell into it and loved it. But now you have a team, you're managing 14 people. Yeah. And what are like some of the secrets to effectively managing a team? Basically, there's two main things. There's clarity and there's over communication. So clarity is me really knowing what I actually want. Mm. Because when you're managing people, it's like your own actions then get leveraged up 14 yeah. times over because you have 14 people on your team. Mm. That means if you're like 5% in the wrong direction, that gets magnified 14 times and you end up in a completely different place than when you were where you wanted to go. And like with a lot of us creators, we didn't go into it with a clear vision and with, with a clear plan of like, this is where I'm going to be because it's like creator economy. It's yeah. so uncertain, like who knows what's going to happen. And so I, we had this problem where I, I didn't know what I wanted. I kept mm. changing my mind. We'd go down that angle poof, times 14. And then it's like, uh oh, quite back. And then there, and then there. And it's only recently that I've really started to distill, really getting clarity myself on what I actually want and then translating that into goals for the team. And the second big learning has been over communication. There is no such thing as over communication. Over -communication. Yeah. And every single problem that we've ever had in the business has been because of a lack of communication. Mm. Because I'll think something and then, you know, I'll say, oh, I want this course to be world class. But I want, like, what does world class mean? <laughs> it's like Alison, our head of customer success, will think world class means something and she'll start doing stuff. And I'll be like, what's, what's going on? Six months later, Alison and I will have a conversation. We'll be like, we never actually sat down to define what do we mean by world class? And she has something in her head and I have something in my head. It's like, oh, well, that's why we're not on the same page because we're just using these words. Hmm. So over communication in terms of really defining expectations and results and outcomes, but also in giving feedback and receiving feedback. What has been the secret to your productivity? I mean, that's what the book's about. Uh, but the, <laughs> the secret... So you guys should go and buy the book, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Pre-order it <laughs> in the description. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all the plugs. Um, the secret is really to find a way to make it feel enjoyable, meaningful, and sustainable. How do I make it fun? Hmm. How do I make it generate energy rather than drain my energy? How do I make sure it's aligned with where I actually want to go? And how do I make sure I'm not burning myself out? Hmm. And luckily, I've managed to find a format of video where I can just learn something, I can read a book, I can spend an hour planning the video, I can hit record, and then I send it to my editors to make it look pretty. And they do a great, uh, a great job of making the videos amazing. Whereas I would not be able to do what you do, where you fly around the world and stuff and like <laughs> spend hours and hours and hours
hours editing a video, like that feels like really hard work. Yeah. And it's not the thing that I am, that would light me up inside. Mm. What lights me up inside is, oh, I read a book and then I can tell people about it. Do you know the next 10 videos you're going to make now? You have a calendar or how does that work? So it's gone through different levels. So back in the day, I was like, okay, I need to make a video this week. What's the video? That was like year one. Year two and three was, I've got a system. I've got a database. Every time I have an idea from reading a book, from what listening to an episode of a podcast, I would be looking at YouTube analytics. Ooh, that video is done well for Thomas Frank. Why don't I do a similar video? It would go into the idea machine and then at some point the video would be made. Honestly, I don't really have to worry about the ideas because Tintin, my YouTube producer, says, Ali, I think the audience would really like a video called this. And this hmm. is the title and here's the thumbnail. And I'm like, all right, I'll make it happen. Oh, wow. So the ideas get given to me. And if I have an idea, I'm like, oh, Tintin, it would be, uh, I've just read this book. It would be a cool video. He'll like find a summary of the book. He'll find the title and the thumbnail and then I'll make the video. Do you know any Ed Sheeran songs? Oh yeah, I know Ed Sheeran songs. Pick up um, and play along. Perfect? Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I found a love for me. Darling, just dive right in. How many bedroom apartment is this, by the way? Uh, five. Five room apartment? Five bedrooms in the apartment. Oh, wow. Um, and this is the podcast room. Oh, I see this place in the videos all the time. <laughs> this is where we oh, sit wow. down and we do our recording. We've got the microphones, we've got the cameras, we've got the lights, we've got the natural light. Yeah. Nice. And this apartment costs like how much? It says 10.6K a month. Pounds? Yeah. I know. <laughs> how many of you make that from YouTube videos? Really <laughs> I don't even know I make. I don't make that sometimes in the month. <laughs> but this is cool. I think it's very functional. It's very and functional. I like I like the fact that how it was designed in terms of like you can just sit down yeah. and get stuff done. Yeah, as long as we just hit the record buttons, everything is good. And for you, what's it like living in London? It's so nice. It's a really nice place to be. All my friends are in London. People internationally often come to London. Mm. Like previously I was living in Cambridge. But like if you visited London, you wouldn't come to Cambridge because it's miles away. But you'd be in London. And so London is like the hub in the UK where everything happens. What's the highest amount of money you made from one video? <laughs> I think my video about passive income hmm. has made 150K. Wow, one video. I think, and one video, I think, something like that. It's, it's, it's something insane, like over 100K from just one video. That's crazy, wow. We weren't even gonna film it. Me and Angus, one, to one day were like, oh, okay, how about we just film this video? And we're like, all right, let's just, okay, yeah, let's go, boom. Hmm. 10 million views, 100K revenue. Like, I think all of our top five videos have been videos that were prepped in like 20 minutes. Hmm. So it's almost like for us, we found that there isn't really a relationship between how much time goes into the video and how valuable the video seems to be to people. I think that reminds me of that, the, the fact that 80% of your results come from 20% of your efforts. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Do you ever feel pressured or burnout? out? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I think having sponsor video deadlines feels pressure because there's a deadline. Sometimes I've been in a position where because the month is, is about to end and the sponsor needs a video out, we've put out a video that I haven't been happy with. The only reason we put it out is because the sponsor was a deadline. That yeah. feels really bad. I'm like, oh, what the hell am I doing? Yeah. And it's like, it's good money. And it's like, oh, yeah. all this kind of stuff. So now what we have is like, we don't work with sponsors who give us deadlines. Hmm. I've just said to the team, I'm happy to take the hit. Like, honestly, we're going to make a million a year from sponsorship. I'd rather make no money from sponsorships and not have deadlines so that I only release a video I'm proud of. What are some of the challenges you faced? Because, yeah, you know, people are hearing like, oh, it makes so, 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 so. But I'm sure there are definitely challenges that you faced. Yeah, so... In the early days, time was the biggest challenge. Mm. And we, we, we talked about this, how I was working full time and yeah. how like, yeah, I didn't have time to do all the things. So yeah. I had to try and be more productive. Yeah. Once I started hiring people, yeah. the, the challenge became managing people and understanding that like there are different personalities and trying to figure out what I wanted because then I can tell the team what I want. But if I don't know what I want, then it's like, I can tell the team what I want. Yeah. <laughs> but, the, but the challenges when you have a team are very different to the challenges when you're doing it. In the early days, the challenges around how do I do this more efficiently? Now the challenge is how do I give my team the clarity and the alignment they need to then do the things efficiently? Hmm. So it's a different sort of level of challenge. We spend about a million a year on team salaries. A million a year? Yeah, ish. Give That's, or take. <laughs> That's so, a lot of pressure. <laughs> and so the business has to make at least like, way more than a million a year for it to be worthwhile. Wow. I think overall this year, we will spend 1.9 million pounds, which is like $2.4 million ish. Wow. And so there's like a level of pressure there. Yeah. And it's kind of nice because we're still very cash flow positive. Like we're not, we don't have a cash problem, but it does feel like, uh oh, there is more pressure than there once was. Do you also invest in other stuff outside YouTube? Yeah, mostly the S&P 500, but okay. also I have a few rental properties that we're slowly trying to build up off the ground. Okay, awesome. So this is the YouTube studio. Wow. It's slightly messy right now. 
Wow. But it's a vibe. So basically, this is. Oh, this is where you usually sit. Uh, so this is where I film the videos. videos. Oh wow. Where we've got the FX3 over here or the FX6 or something like that. I can't remember what camera this actually is. Mm. And we just film the videos from here and it's great vibes. Oh. And we've got an overhead camera here and we have a shorts vertical camera over there. Oh, so wow. Every single thing can be filmed just from a single place. This must have taken a long time to set up because I can see so much gear, like here, like live yeah. cameras, everything. It's a bit of a mess. Like it looks nice, that angle, but like this angle is like such a complete mess. But, mm. no, but no one sees this angle except you. You're the first person to see this angle. <laughs> Everyone just sees the angle that looks nice with like... Yeah, because I always see I always see all of this here and I always see the lights and I'm like, oh, this is actually pretty big. And it looks big. It looks much, it's big, it's a big space, but it looks way bigger on camera. What's up guys, this is Ali Abdal and I'm going to be sharing with you 20 tips on how to stay productive in 20 minutes. Can you show them the, the view on this yeah. screen? <laughs> wow. And you can have that recording as well so you'll see exactly what that looks like. Oh wow, this is nice. You this is see, a Sennheiser. You want to see something else that's cool? Okay. The other cool thing is that if you want to write anything down, we've got an overhead camera as well. Oh. So you can write something, you can show tech, you can like okay. do a yeah, review yeah, of an iPhone. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Wow. Why do you live such a simple lifestyle? I mean, this this apartment is pretty fancy. Like, okay, uh, yeah, I, it's fancy. Know, we, yeah. we, we spend we spend quite a lot on this apartment. But it's also where you work. It's also where we work. So like, it's, it can a, be a you know, work Most expense. of it is a business expense. Yeah, exactly. It's like very ROI positive. Yeah. And I have a Tesla Model Three that I've had for three years. That's a nice car. That's a nice car. Yeah. So <laughs> the thing is, like, for me, I I ask myself the question of if I won the lottery mm -hmm. and if I had a hundred million in the bank, how would I spend my time? And I think, well, I'd still make videos. I still do podcasts. I still hang out with people when they come to London. I still travel sometimes, still read books, still play video games occasionally. These things are not expensive. And so a very large percentage of the income that comes in mm. ends up going into investments, into mm. real estate or into the S&P and stuff. Because I don't actually need that much money mm. to live. If we include rent and stuff, like 150K a year, that's mm. how much I spend on stuff. So you talked about your YouTube Creator Academy, the part-time YouTuber Academy, and it takes you through the journey of becoming a creator. That's the one. So yeah, guys, if you actually want to <laughs> learn how to be a creator, definitely check it out. It's going to be in the description. Too. It's expensive. Like you don't need a course to learn okay. how to be a creator. Okay. It's just like you know, for people who have more money than time, we, yeah. s we save them time. Hmm. That's basically it. Okay. So the average age of our students is 36. Oh really? Half of them are the US, the other half are in the UK. We have almost no one in Africa signing up for the course because obviously, like, yeah, it's expensive. Power and stuff. It's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's an expensive course. If someone's watching this and is keen, we have a very good scholarship program, so you can apply for a scholarship and oh, okay, and you get free access to the course. So I apply for a scholarship if you're watching this. Yeah. <laughs> How important is it for a creator to have a product? Because I see like a lot of creators like Mr. Beast, KSI, and having Prime festivals, and you also have the course. I think it's very important because if you don't have a product, you're relying on two things, AdSense and brand deals. Now AdSense requires you to hit certain number of views and brand deals also require you to hit certain number of views and now you're dealing with a brand. Yeah. And so you're selling a product is just not your own product. If a brand is paying, I don't know, 5K for a sponsorship, they're making more than 5K Definitely. from your work. Yeah. Maybe they're making 20K or yeah. 30K. Now if it's your own product and you plug your own product, you make all of that money Yeah. rather than the 5K that the brand is paying you. And so I think a lot of people are scared of making a product, A, because they don't know what their audience would buy, B, because they don't know how, and C, because they're afraid of coming across like a salesman. And I had to fight all these like internal struggles with building a product and selling a product three mm. years ago when we released the course. But I think a product is super important because it means that you have a business. A business is a thing that makes money by providing value. And YouTube is kind of weird because we make free money through AdSense. Yeah. And then you make kind of make semi-free money through brand deals because they just come in, you don't have to work. For, but really, if you're building a business, you need to be able to sell something. Mm. And there are a lot of creators who have very big audiences who cannot sell something to their audience. And that makes it a very stressful business. Whereas I know people who have 10,000 subscribers who are making 500K a year. Really? Yeah. So August Bradley, for example, he, he made a Notion channel. He had 15K subscribers and his first course sold for like, I think he did 650,000 that year. 15,000 subscribers, 650,000 revenue because he was targeting an audience of adults who had money, who were in the US and who could pay 3K for a course. How much do you think you, you spend on equipment averagely? Probably like 50K a year. Not 50K a year, like 30K a year. Hmm. Okay, because you already bought it. We've already bought it a lot. Yeah. Like a lot of this is just very slow. Like I've had this light since 2018. Hmm. I've had this microphone since 2019. Hmm. I've had this, well, this is new, but like a lot, a lot of the stuff here is very old. I've had this since 2019. 
So here, what, what happens here? I can see like, if you walk oh, and you... Dude, this is so good. <laughs> so this is a treadmill desk. Oh, which wow. Which means, so like earlier today, I was writing my email newsletter just on the iPad. Okay. And so what you do is, now, I can just walk while working. <laughs> so you're walking out while walking. Yeah, this is, this is productive. But how, isn't it difficult to type? No, try it. Do you want to have a go? Yeah, let me have a go. Have a go. Okay. Okay. Hang on, let's wait for it to pause. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. it pauses once you leave. Once okay, you yeah, so, it. so you get on that and then I'll, I'll play it and we'll see okay. what, what it looks like. Now I'm going to start here. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and you can set the speed a bit, so we'll start okay. slow. And you're quite tall, so let's make the desk go up a bit. Okay. So, hope what I type, we don't scatter what you're. Ah, okay, let's just start on you. Yeah, yes. Okay. Oh, okay, this works actually. Yeah. Oh, not so bad. So on that speed, <laughs> you walk, every hour you walk four kilometers. Really? Yeah. Wow. So you've already walked 100 steps. What's the future for Ali Abdal? I think for me, the long-term plan is to be a book writer. Mm. I like writing books. You know, this is the first one. Yeah, just like this one, yeah. Check out the book. Mm. And I really like the idea of just being able to continue playing this infinite game mm. where I get to learn stuff, apply it to my life and share it with people, whether it's in the form of videos or podcasts or writing. I just keep on doing that. So I don't really have any goals. Mm. I just kind of want to do more of the same thing. Oh, wow. Um, there's this book called Finite and Infinite Game, which mm. kind of talks about this. If it's a finite game, the objective is to win. But if it's an infinite game, the objective is to continue playing the game. Like hanging out with friends is an infinite game. There's no goal, there's no objective. You just enjoy the hanging out. I think similarly for me, doing this business is an infinite game where I can't wait to get out of the shower so that I can just learn something and share something and teach something. Do you still feel excited the same way you were when you started? I still feel excited, but in a different way. So mm. back at the start, I felt excited about the creation of the video. Yeah. I was learning how to edit. I was learning how to film, learning yeah. what shutter speed and ISO meant. I was like, I can finally afford to upgrade my A6000 to an A6500. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I can now afford an A7 III. <laughs> wow, I'm shooting in four. That was exciting in the yeah. early days. Nowadays, what's exciting is it's still exciting to learn something and share it, but systemizing that process and trying to thinking, who could I hire that would make this video twice as good without me having to do anything? What can I ask our editors to do in sound design that would make this video interesting? Can I hire a writer to just write shorts for me? Because I, really, I don't really like shorts. So can we just churn out shorts that are not written by me? Can I hire a CTO to build a software company within our company? Hmm. Can I hire someone to work with to build build hardware like keyboards and laptop bags and like the game of building the kind of business empire around me. That's the bit that's really exciting while I continue being able to share what I love through videos. One of the problems a lot of creators face is when something is built to them, then it becomes like I have to always be there and yeah. it's difficult to now scale it up. Have you thought about that or what is like your approach to that? The way I think of it is like I don't mind so much because I will always want to be learning sharing stuff yeah but i do feel the sense of pressure that if to i have to film a video and i don't like that pressure mm. and so what we're trying to get to is can we build products and assets that do not have my name on them but that still benefit from me as a distribution channel so can we build a productivity app can mm. we build productivity hardware mm. can we build an email kind of like Ryan Holiday's Daily Stoic. You know, we're thinking of, could we do a daily productivity, which mm. is a daily email? And can we grow that where initially I write it, but then we can hire a writer for it and it doesn't have to be me anymore. Like Colin and Samir have their newsletter, The Published Press. They don't write it. They have a team of writers and an editor and a whole team around it. It's like, that's really cool because now The Published Press is an asset that is distinct from Colin and Samir. Similarly, Mr. Beast has Feastables. It's really hard to do physical products, but yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of being trying to build these assets that are not tied to me. What's like your most favorite? This one is favorite my, books, yeah. My upcoming book, Field oh. Productivity. Oh. Yeah. So this is, you know, we've got a few mock-ups because we're playing around with like cover designs and things like that. Oh wow! I didn't know you write too. Yeah. That's, that's my jam. So uh, I've been working on this book for three years, and it's finally ready. Apart from this one, what other oh, books yeah. do you do you also like? Yeah. Um. Or what's your? So this is the book that's most changed my life. This is the Four Hour Work Week by mm. Tim Ferriss. Amazing book. Um. Kind of old school. A lot of the ideas in this are fairly standard now. This is the book that taught me about passive income. This is the book I read when I was 18 years old, mm. just as I was going into medical school. That oh, made wow. me realize, oh my God, you can make money on the internet. You can make money on the side. It was like, I can be a doctor, but I can make money on the side. Wow, that sounds amazing. So this book changed my life. Awesome. And how many books do you read in like, uh, in like, in like a year? I don't know, like sometimes, uh, on, on average, one or two a week. Hmm. So like 50 to 100 a year. I, I, I have phases. If I'm writing my book a lot, then I re read less. But. Hmm. This is another big one. This one also changed my life. Show your walk. Oh, your work. yeah. 
Yeah. This book, I read it in 2016, and this yeah. helped me get over the fear of starting a blog. So I made a website and started yeah. writing online. Hmm. And a year, 18 months later, I started the YouTube channel. And I think without this book, I would not have started the YouTube channel. I think the one, the one I also love too is still like an artist. Oh, I, yeah. I read this some some time, I think two years ago, and I was like, oh, okay. It teaches you about being creative and getting ideas from like everywhere. Oh, this is nice. This is a nice bookshelf. What's the plan? Do you eventually plan on like settling down? You know, a lot of creators feel like sometimes like if they settle down, like someone like me now, I'm always scared like, okay, you know, I'm constantly traveling. I won't have time to like settle down because I'm always in one country or the other. I don't want to have kids and be away from them. And a lot of creators feel like settling down might be slowing down. So what about you? Is this something you look forward to? How do you plan on managing yeah, that? I'm all for settling down. Okay. I, think, I think for the next one or two years, I yeah. want to do the travel thing. Okay. So I want to do the digital nomad thing, mm -hmm. live in different countries, like live the travel lifestyle yeah then i want to settle down i want to work with a team who's in person and i want to be able to wake up in the mornings go to the studio film a video and then chill the rest of the day hang out with the family pick the kids up from school so that's what i'm kind of building towards hmm. how do i build a business that is sustainable with me putting in like three hours a day of work hmm. where i can work from anywhere and i can hang out with the family like that's the that's, that's the, the goal yeah awesome so my final question for you is a lot of creators who are watching this across the globe what's your advice to them on becoming as successful as you are <laughs> or even more successful or anyone yeah. um i think it's a few so firstly yeah. it depends on where they are in the journey yeah so if you're just getting started yeah. then don't overthink it and just keep on making videos mm. because the most important step is to get going yeah. there are so many people that hold themselves back from starting a youtube channel writing a blog whatever the thing might be because fear because of worry about what their friends and family will think mm. because of a concern of like oh it's not going to go anywhere it's too saturated all those fears it's like you have to get started yeah once the ship is moving yeah at that point you have to ask yourself is this a hobby or is it a business if it's a hobby then it's for you and it's to have fun if it's a business it's for the audience hmm. and the objective is to provide value and make money so in a way a hobby is selfish selfish in like a non-morally judgmental way but like a yeah. hobby is selfish yeah. and a business is service yeah so selfishness versus serviceness service hmm. versus service <laughs> and if it's a hobby for you then okay make whatever you want but then do not feel sad if you're not making money or if you're not getting views hmm. because you've chosen to make whatever you want but if it's a business now it's not about you and it's about getting letting go of your own ego obviously you still want to have fun along the way but fundamentally you have to understand that a business exists to serve its customers and when you're making a YouTube channel if you're a creator your viewers are the customers they're not paying with their money but they're paying with their time and their attention and arguably time and attention is even more valuable than money because you can always make more, more money you can never make more time so what is the product that you're creating that someone else would be willing to pay for with their time the mm. only thing they cannot get back mm. and if you think like a business and you think like that and for example you read some business books and you get some maybe a business coach whatever it looks like but you can read loads of books they're all free on the internet and in various different ways you can treat your creator thing as a business. And I think a big part of my success, other than luck, has been treating it like a business from day one and not thinking, oh, I just want to make videos that I like. It's like, no, the point of the videos is to help other people. Hmm. And that's how you build a business. You don't build a business by appealing to your own ego. You build a business by appealing to trying to help someone else in some way. Hmm. So that's what I would say. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much for the interview. This was fun. Thank you so much. This was fun. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure a lot of people out there are inspired by your story and they learned a lot from the video. Um, so guys, uh, we've put all the links in the description below if you want to pre-order the book coming out before the end of this year uh click the link below and also check out the, the part-time creator academy so yeah thank you guys uh that's all we have to share with you today if you love this video please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you on the next one peace